start off with talking about the Emancipation Proclamation and then General Order 3, and we'll wrap up with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution and celebrating Juneteenth. Most of our history is often sanitized for all of us so that we can, um, and that's everybody's history. It's uh, whoever writes the textbooks is the final arbiter of what is history. But um, Emancipation Proclamation was a speech given by Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. And there's a lot of controversy about why did Lincoln do this? Was his goal to free the slaves? What was his thinking at the time? And let me start off by sharing something with you. Uh, uh, President Lincoln wrote a letter to Horace Greenlee, the editor of the New York Tribune, which at that time was uh, the New York Times. And um, Horace Greenlee editorial, and this is um, President Link, part of President Lincoln's uh, response to that editorial. Because I tell you all, I talk to you all all the time about how important op-eds are and how important editorials are. But his editorial, and this was President Lincoln writes, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would. And if I could save it by freeing all of the slaves, I would. And if I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And this letter is very famous letter. While he was, while this letter was being published, the president was working on the Emancipation Proclamation. But it's important to note that the Emancipation Proclamation freed very few slaves because there were so many exceptions, only those states that were in active rebellion. And even among those states, for instance, in Louisiana, several of the parishes or counties were excluded from having to have to save slaves. But the Emancipation Proclamation uh, took place, as I said, January 1st, 1863. The first group of people who uh, freed their slaves were the slave owners in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., there's something called Emancipation Day, and it's still celebrated downtown uh, on 13th Street in Washington, 13th in Pennsylvania. And that is that uh, the slaves in Washington, D.C. were freed on April 16, 19, 1862. 1862. And they were the first. This was before the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, most people always think that after the Emancipation Proclamation, all of the slaves threw down their tools in the fields and ran out as if they were going to, imagine going to Walmart on, Good, on um, Black Friday. And all the crowd is there. Then they open the door and everybody runs through and then says, we're free. That's not exactly the way it happened. What happened was that each state had to be independently um, captured by the Union Army. Now, what happened in each state freed their slaves at a different time. And then those states that had succeeded from the Union and joined the Confederacy came back into the United States and back into Congress at different dates. Uh, so at the time, there were 34 states, and uh, 13 of those states were joined the Confederacy. But 11 states were in were fighting because the state of Missouri and Kentucky remained neutral. Now, there were two more uh, slaveholding states, and that was Delaware and Maryland, but they never joined the Confederacy. And remember, the Confederacy was a succession of slave-holding states, and it lasted for only four years. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation began 
a whole host of activities that weakened the Confederacy and put this country on the path to free slaves. There is mythology that the people in Texas got the word late. And that's why two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, when other states had already freed their slaves, the slaves in Texas were the last to be free. And there's a reason for that. After the Mississippi and Louisiana went down to the Union Army, many of the slaveholders and the slaves walked to Texas because Texas was the most Western state of all the states in the Confederacy. And it was geographically the last uh, for the Union Army to get there. And so they were still a slaveholding state. One of the things that uh, many people believed at the time was that Texas was going to become its own country. And if you know any Texans, like Mike King and others and Angela, you'll know that many of them still believe that Texas is their own country. Their flag is the biggest flag. That Texas flag is everywhere. Texans love Texas. And all of them do. Black, white, brown, everybody who lives in Texas loves Texas. Well, so here you had all these people moving to Texas because they believed that they could still be in a slave-holding state. Another issue that people don't talk about a lot is that many of the Confederate states elongated their battle and fought as long as they could because they needed someone to bring the crops in. Remember, a lot of this took place during summer months, spring months. There were year-round crops because these were a lot of them were southern states. And um, the whole issue of commerce and money played into this because if the slaves were free, who was going to pick the crops and prepare the harvest and do the work on these large plantations that generated a lot of money? So that was also one of the issues. Now, let's get to general order number three. This is where the mythology is and that Texans hate this when people say they got the word late. They got the word late. It wasn't because they got the word late. It was because they were from, they were the strongest state at that time. And there were five general orders and the general Gordon Granger came from New Orleans, which had been a Union Army outpost, to Texas. He arrived with thousands of soldiers, and he stood on the balcony of something called Ashton Villa, which is a beautiful building. I've been there. It's still there. And there were five orders. But General Order Number 3 said, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with proclamation from the executive of the United States, now note that Lincoln was already dead, when this happened. All slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of employer and free laborer. So that is the general order number three that freed the slaves in the last slaveholding state of Texas. My friend says that her father and grandfather said, the word wasn't late. We were waiting for the men with the guns to come. <laughs> that we weren't, we weren't going anywhere until the men from the Union Army with the guns came. So that is a back and forth lore about general order number three. Now, what the Emancipation Proclamation did, and then general order number three on June 19th, 1865, therefore we have Juneteenth, what they did was open up the country to look at ways to make this the law. Because people were still fighting, people were still defending their, their plantations and their crops and their way of living. And um, each state had to be, as I said before, taken down one by one. So in order to make this whole union, the United States, a union where slaves were not 
held the 13th Amendment had to be passed and it had to be ratified by the required numbers of states. So ratifying that, that uh, amendment first in the Senate, then in the House, I think Alabama was the last state to ratify this. It had to be ratified by all the qualifying states at that time. So it was ratified uh, on December 6, 1865. So 1865 was a big year, and that was really the year that slaves were freed on paper and legally in this country. The, um, and that most of the states that were in rebellion put down their arms and started to try to figure out how to um, start a new country. Now, right now, 47 states celebrate Juneteenth. So Juneteenth is getting more notoriety, but it's not new. State legislatures have passed uh, legislation that makes it an official state in 47 states, except North Dakota, South Dakota, and Hawaii. Now, Texas, of course, was the first state to ratify in their state legislature Juneteenth as an official state holiday, and that took place in 1979. But it's important to note that throughout our country, and even today, we are a country of compromises. Because in the same piece of legislation, while June 19th was uh, ratified as Juneteenth, January 19th was ratified as Confederate Heroes Day. So that was, that is in what was a uh, state holiday in Texas as well, and in other states as well. So uh again there were states that wanted to preserve uh what they considered the her heroics of the confederacy and you hear about this a lot now about statutes and all but um uh, it was celebrated so uh, that is an important thing to remember that we are a country of compromises and that uh, there was no uh, one day when everyone was free. Now, how did we celebrate Juneteenth? There are parades. There are parades here in Washington, all over the country. There's a big, there's a big celebration in Indianapolis and other uh, places. Uh, the General Order Number no. 3 and the Emancipation Proclamation are recited. There's barbecue, red velvet cake, and anybody who knows me knows that's my favorite food in the world. Uh, red soda and red food. And there's a significance of red and, and red drinks and food because of blood. This is a reminder uh, that African Americans were once property, were once slaves. But it's also an opportunity to celebrate celebrate the strength we possess to have survived one of the worst forms of human bondage in history. One that ripped families apart, took children away from mothers, made it illegal for slaves to read or write, to learn to read or write, and removed culture from the slaves, the culture that they came to this country with. Now, there's a quote that is often attributed to Thomas Jefferson and to Frederick Douglass, and it is that good can prevail, but the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Actually, this quote came from an Irishman, John Philpot Curran. He was an Irish politician and judge, and he died in 1817. And he said, and I think this is a good place for us to end, he said, the condition upon which God hath given liberty to man is eternal vigilance. So I hope that you know a little bit more about Juneteenth and about the long, painful process, state by state, of emancipation of the slaves. So thank you for sharing part of your morning with me. If you have questions, please send them to Michael McGrath and we will try to put them on VOA Connect. Thank you.